the freedom and the austerity of the desert life satisfied some deep instinct in him. He could match the Bedouin in all their activities, for he'd brought his powers of endurance to a high pitch and took pleasure in keeping them there. He had to make many long, solitary rides in order to maintain the coherence of the tribes, for he saw it as part of his role there to preach as well as to fight. The remarkable thing is that throughout the campaign he carried a camera and took hundreds of these superb photographs, besides writing detailed dispatches for Cairo and keeping a diary and notes. For this was a literary adventure as well as a military one. He was planning to write a book one day, if he lived. Jerusalem, with a great swinging blow through the Judean hills, it fell on December the 9th, 1917, and a triumphal entry was staged. Lawrence hurried back to be present at what he described as the supreme moment of the war. This, after all, had been the goal of the Crusaders. He was hastily fitted out with a proper uniform by his fellow officers for the occasion. Here he came across Lowell Thomas, who was later to play a very large part in his story. I met Lawrence in Jerusalem. Allenby had called him in from the desert to decorate him in front of the Tower of David. I encountered Lawrence first on one of the narrow streets. He was with some Arabs. He didn't look like an Arab to me. And a little bit later, I got in touch with the British military governor of Jerusalem. I called him the successor to Pontius Pilate, Sir Ronald Storrs. And I told Storrs about this group of Arabs, and one who was a blonde uh, wondered who he was. And Storrs opened a door to an adjoining room, and there he was. And Storrs was the one who was responsible for uh, labeling Lawrence, because he said to me, I want you to meet the uncrowned king of Arabia. The seeds of legend were being sown. in his life did Lawrence attempt to have a romantic relationship with a woman. Her name was Janet Laurie. 
There was always something he was not satisfied with, even as a small child, a secret something of unhappiness. I felt I ought to take care of him or protect him, rather like an older sister toward a clever younger brother. I was not prepared for the change in his affection. We were joking about his brother when he suddenly proposed. There'd been no warning, no indication, not even a kiss. I knew he was serious, but, well, he was two years younger than me and not tall enough. In my astonishment, I laughed at him. He seemed hurt, but merely said, Oh, I see. And we spoke no more about it. Much of Lawrence's time was spent in the Ashmolean Museum, adding antiquities he'd collected to its display cases. The magnet for him, though, was the keeper of the museum, D.G. Hogarth. A formidable and autocratic man, he guided Lawrence through much of his adult life. All my opportunities, all those I've wasted, came out of his trust in me. He is the only man I never had to let into my confidence. He would get there naturally. It's possible that without Hogarth, there would have been no Lawrence of Arabia. With the resources of Oxford at his call, he saturated Lawrence in military history and the complexities of the East. His interest was not just paternal. Hogarth was a political intelligence officer for the English government. Well, I don't know, Hogarth. This fellow Lawrence strikes me as a rum sort. That business of his parents' lack of marital legality, shall we say, could lead to instability. Now, you surprise me. The service has never had cause to doubt my selections before. Oh, nor do we now, my dear fellow, not at all. Just a small flicker of uh, anxiety, which I must always support your recommendation. Thank you. As to his background, I'm sure you'll find that he's overcome it. He is a most unusual possibility. What did you have in mind for him? I'm not precisely sure yet. He's like Quicksilver, this one. Devastatingly accurate and powerful, but only when channeled and disciplined. I rather like him. Uh, so he'll probably end up in Arabia with me. <laughs> Keep the favored chicks on the best turf, eh? Well, why not? Incidentally, the minister asked me to express his gratitude to you for your notes on the expanding German influence in Syria. Apparently, they quite turned the tide for him in cabinet. Mm, I'm delighted to hear it. He'd also like your thoughts on Gerablus, the expedition, you know. And Lawrence? Full agreement and assistance. I've encouraged him as well to join the Oxford Officer Training Corps. Seems to have taken to some parts of it. Quite well. The training continued. In 1909, Lawrence left for Arabia. Hogarth had arranged for the journey and bought him a camera. For the young man, the great game began. You have the papers I've prepared for you. It's safely in there. Piri Gordon's map is enclosed in here. So you'll find it rather meager in some areas. Geography a little askew, that sort of thing. I would consider it a sizable favor, Ned, if you would bring it up to scratch. Uh, accurate indications of terrain, sizes of villages, stations, railways, you know the information I require. Not forgetting your blessed castles, of course. Of course. Don't worry, DG. I'll provide you with everything you need and have some fine adventures into the bargain. student, he carefully studied the Crusader castles for his thesis. 
but a greater event was taking place. Seduced by the light, the people, and the timelessness of it all, Lawrence was surrendering himself to Arabia. Each time his camera clicked, it shaped a deeper and deeper conviction that this place was home. Already his perceptions were turning into judgments, some of them prophetic. Palestine was once a beautiful land and could be so again. The sooner the Jews farm it all, the better. Their colonies are bright spots in the desert. His journey was a remarkable achievement, but in the way in which he wrote about it and in the stories that grew, the illusion, the magic trick, again won out. He returned to Oxford penniless, but that's how legends are made. After graduation, Lawrence was unsure of his future. Hogarth again intervened and sent him to Jurablis in Syria as an assistant archaeologist. The next four years were the happiest of his life. I have found a friend in our water boy, Dahum. He is strong and, I think, honest. More intelligent than the others, he also wrestles beautifully. of his boy, Dahum, Lawrence realized his long-held dream. Chivalry and loyalty unto death, the challenge of a holy quest, and the power and romance of a medieval prince. The brass images he had so carefully traced as a boy came alive in him. at Carchemish to the Arabian coast, Lawrence found the secure home he wanted. A mostly male society gave him freedom, importance, and the joy of his friendship with Darfum. His superior, Leonard Woolley, was concerned about the young man going native. I'd find that work had stopped, and there Lawrence would be sitting on the ground discussing some obscure piece of tribal law. And yet his memory for the fit of a fragment was extraordinary. And he could describe from memory accurately a piece of pottery that we had dug up last season. He would make the most brilliant suggestions, but would seldom offer any argument in support of them. He expected you to see them for yourself, and if you did not agree, he would relapse into silence and smile. Archaeology was not his only task. Arabia was awakening from a long sleep, and the discovery of oil was attracting other countries. In any war with Turkey for control of the area, strategic information would be vital to Britain's success. Lawrence sent regular reports back to Hogarth. It was mostly, though, a time of indolence and pleasure. Lawrence taught Dahoon to read, to shoot, and to photograph. Their unusual friendship was the source of much curiosity among the workmen, though the Arabian foreman, Hamoudi, was firm in his opinions. 
I also loved the boy Dahum when we were all together. But Lawrence was consumed by his desire.